Descartes, A History of Modern Philosophy. Book 4, René Descartes, 1596-1650, was a Frenchman born in Touraine and belonging by family to the inferior nobility. Educated at the Jesuit College of La Fleche, he early acquired a distaste for the scholastic philosophy, or at least for its details. The theology of scholasticism, as we shall see, left a deep impression on him through life. On leaving college, he took up mathematics, varied by a short plunge into the dissipations of Paris. Some years of military service as a volunteer with the Catholic armies at the beginning of the Thirty Years' War enabled him to travel and see the world. Returning to Paris, he resumed his studies, but found them seriously interrupted by the tactless Boers, who, as we know from Molière's amusing comedy Les Facheux, long continued to infest French society. To escape their assiduities, Descartes, who prized solitude before all things, fled the country. The inheritance of an independent income enabled the philosopher to live where he liked, and Holland became, with a few interruptions, his chosen residence for the next twenty years, 1629 to 49. Even here, frequent changes of residence and occasional concealment of his address were necessary in order to elude the visits of importunate admirers. With all his unsociability, there seems to have been something singularly magnetic about the personality of Descartes. Yet he only fell in with one congenial spirit, the Princess Elizabeth, daughter of the unfortunate Winter King and granddaughter of our James Wast. Possessing to the fullest extent the intellectual brilliancy and the incomparable charm of the Stuart family, this great lady impressed the lonely thinker as the only person who ever understood his philosophy. Another royal friendship brought his career to an untimely end. Queen Christina of Sweden, the gifted and restless daughter of Gustavus Adolphus, heard of Descartes and invited him to her court. On his arrival, she sent for the pilot who had brought the illustrious stranger to Stockholm and questioned him about his passenger. Madame, he replied, it is not a man whom I conducted to your majesty, but a demigod. He taught me more in three weeks of the science of seamanship and of winds and navigation than I had learned in the sixty years I had been at sea, Miss E.S. Haldane's life of René Descartes. The Queen fully came up to the expectations of her visitor, in whose eyes she had no fault but an unfortunate tendency to waste her time on learning Greek. Besides her other merits, she possessed a sweetness and goodness which made men devoted to her service. It soon appeared that, as with others of the same rank, this was only the veneer of a heartless selfishness. Christina, who was an early riser, required his attendance in her library to give her lessons in philosophy at five o'clock in the morning. Descartes was by habit a very late riser. Besides, he had not even a lodging in the royal palace, but was staying at the French embassy, and in going there had to pass over a long bridge which was always bitterly cold. The cold killed him. He had arrived at Stockholm in October and meant to leave in January, but remained at the urgent request of the Queen, who, however, made no change in the hour of their interviews, although that winter was one of the severest on record. At the beginning of February, 1650, he fell ill and died of inflammation of the lungs on the eleventh in the fifty-fourth year of his age. Descartes had the physical courage which Hobbes lacked, but he seems, like Bacon, to have been a moral coward. The most striking instance of this is that, on hearing of Galileo's condemnation for teaching the heliocentric astronomy, he withheld from publication and had even thoughts of destroying a work of his own in which the same doctrine was maintained. This was at a time when he was living in a country where the, there could be no question of personal danger from the Inquisition. But something of the same weakness shows itself in his running away from France to escape those intrusions on his studious retirement which one would think might have been checked by letting it be known with sufficient firmness that his hours could not be wasted on idle conversation and we have seen how at last his life was lost for no better reason than the dread of giving offence to Queen Christina. It seems strange that a character so unheroic should figure among the great emancipators of human thought.
In fact, Descartes' services to liberty have been much exaggerated. His intellectual fame rests on three foundations. Of these, the most indubitable is the creation of analytical geometry, the starting point of modern mathematics. The value of his contributions to physics has been much disputed, but on the whole, expert opinion seems to have decided that what was new in them was not true, and what was true was not new. However, the place we must assign Descartes in the history of philosophy can only be determined by our opinion of his metaphysics. As a philosopher, Descartes has, to begin with, the merit of exemplary clearness. The fault is not with him if we cannot tell what he thought and how he came to think it. The classic discourse on method, 1637, relates his mental history in a style of almost touching simplicity. It appears that from an early age, truth had been his paramount object, not as with Bacon and Hobbes for its utility, but for its own sake. In search of this ideal, he read widely, but without finding what he wanted. The great and famous works of literature might entertain or dazzle, they could not convince. The philosophers professed to teach truth. Their endless disputes showed that they had not found it. Mathematics, on the other hand, presented a pleasing picture of demonstrated certainty, but a certainty that seemed to be prized only as a sure foundation for the mechanical arts. Wearily throwing his books aside, the young man then applied himself to the great book of life, mingling with all sorts and conditions of men to hear what they had to say about the prime interests of existence. But the same vanity and vexation of spirit followed him here. Men were no more agreed among themselves than were the authorities of his college days. The truths of religion seemed indeed to offer a safe refuge, but they were an exception that proved the rule, being, as Descartes observes, a supernatural revelation, not the natural knowledge that he wanted. The conflict of authorities had at least one good result, which was to discredit the very notion of authority, thus throwing the inquirer back on his own reason as the sole remaining resource. And as mathematics seemed, so far, to be the only satisfactory science, the most reasonable course was to give a wider extension and application to the methods of algebra and geometry. Four fundamental rules were thus obtained. One, to admit nothing as true that was not evidently so, two, to analyse every problem into as many distinct questions as the nature of the subject required, three, to ascend gradually from the simplest to the most complex subjects, and four, to be sure that his enumerations and surveys were so exhaustive and complete as to let no essential element of the question escape. The rules as they stand are ill-arranged, vague and imperfect. The last should come first, and the first last. The notions of simplicity, complexity, and truth are neither illustrated nor defined, and no pains are taken to discriminate judgments from concepts. It may be said that the method worked well. At least Descartes tells us that with the help of his rules, he made rapid progress in the solution of mathematical problems. We may the believe in his success without admitting that an inferior genius could have achieved the same results by the same means. The real point is to ascertain whether the method, whatever its utility in mathematics, could be advantageously applied to metaphysics. And the answer seems to be that as manipulated by its author, the new system led to nothing but hopeless fallacies. After reserving a provisional assent to the customs of the country where he happens to be residing and to the creed of the Roman Church, Descartes begins by calling in question the whole mass of beliefs he has hitherto accepted, including the reality of the external world. But the very act of doubt implies the existence of the doubter himself. I think, therefore, I am. It has been supposed that the initial affirmation of this self-evident principle implies that Descartes identified being with thought. He did no such thing. No more is meant to begin with than that whatever else is or is not, I the thinker certainly am. This is no great discovery. The interesting thing is to find out what it implies. A good deal, according to Descartes. First, he infers that, since the act of thinking assures him of his existence, 
Therefore he is a substance the whole essence of which consists in thought, which is independent of place and of any material object. In short, an immaterial soul, entirely distinct from the body, easier to know and capable of existing without it. Here the confusion of conception with judgment is apparent, and it leads to a confusion of our thoughts about reality with the realities themselves. And Descartes carries this loose reasoning a step further by going on to argue that, as the certainty of his own existence has no other guarantee than the clearness with which it is inferred from the fact of his thinking, it must therefore be a safe rule to conclude that whatever things we conceive very clearly and distinctly are all true. In his other great philosophical work, The Meditations, Descartes sets out at greater length, but with less clearness, his arguments for the immateriality of the soul. Here it is fully admitted that, besides thinking, self-consciousness covers the functions of perceiving, feeling, desiring, and willing. Nor does it seem to be pretended that these experiences are reducible to forms of thought. But it is claimed that they depend on thought in the sense that without thought one would not be aware of their existence, whereas it can easily be conceived without them. A little more introspection would show that the second part of the assertion is not true, for there is no thought without words and no words, however inaudibly articulated, without a number of tactual and muscular sensations, nor even without a series of distinct volitions. Another noticeable point is that so far from obeying the methodical rule to proceed from the simple to the complex, Descartes does just the contrary. Starting with the whole complex content of consciousness, he works down by a series of arbitrary rejections to what, according to him, is the simple fact of immaterial thought. Let us see how it fares with his attempt to reconstruct knowledge on that elementary basis. Returning to his postulate of universal doubt, our philosopher argues from this to an imperfection in his nature, and thence to the idea of a perfect being. The reasoning, is most slipshod, for even admitting that knowledge is preferable to ignorance, which has not been proved, it does not follow that the dogmatist is more perfect than the doubter. Indeed, one might infer the contrary from Descartes's having passed with progressive reflection from the one stage to the other. Overlooking the paralogism, let us grant that he has the idea of a perfect being, and go on to the question of how he came to possess it. One might suggest that the consciousness of perfect self-knowledge, combined with the wish to know more of other subjects, would be sufficient to create an ideal of omniscience, and, proceeding in like manner from a comparison of wants with their satisfactions, to enlarge this ideal into the notion of infinite perfection all round. Descartes, however, is not really out for truth, at least not in metaphysics. He is out for a justification of what the Jesuits had taught him at La Fleche, and no Jesuit casuistry could be more sophistical than the logic he finds good enough for the purpose. To argue, as he does, that the idea of a perfect being in his mind can be explained only by its proceeding from such a being as its creator is already sufficiently audacious. But this feat is far surpassed by his famous ontological proof of theism, a triangle, he tells us, need not necessarily exist, but assuming there to be one, its three angles must be equal to two right angles. With God, on the other hand, to be conceived is to be. For existence being a perfection, it follows from the idea of a perfect being that he must exist. The answer is more clear and distinct than any of Descartes's demonstrations. Perfection is affirmed of existing or of imaginary subjects, but existence is not a perfection in itself. A third argument for theism remains to be considered. Descartes asks how he came to exist, not by his own act, for on that hypothesis he would have given himself all the perfections that now he lacks, nor from any other imperfect cause, for that would be to repeat the difficulty, not to solve it. Besides, the simple continuance of his existence from moment to moment needs an explanation, for time consists of an infinity of parts, none depending in any way on the others, so that my having been a little while ago is no reason why I should be now, 
unless there is some power by which I am created anew. Here we must observe that Descartes is playing fast and loose with the law of causation. By what he calls the light of nature, in other words, the light of Greek philosophy, things can no more pass into nothing than they can come out of it. Moreover, the difficulty is the same for my supposed creator as for myself. We are told that thought is a necessary perfection of the divine nature, but thinking implies time. Therefore God also exists from moment to moment. How, then, can he recover his being any more than we can? The answer, of course, would be because he is perfect, and perfection involves existence. Thus the argument from causation throws us back on the so-called ontological argument whose futility has already been shown. This very idea of perfection involves us in fresh difficulties with the law of causation. A perfect being might be expected to make perfect creatures, which by hypothesis we are not. Descartes quite sees this, and only escapes by a verbal quibble. Our imperfections, he says, come from the share that nothingness has in our nature. Once us allow so much to the creative power of zero, and God seems to be a rather gratuitous postulate. After proving to his own satisfaction the existence of the soul and of God, Descartes returns to the starting point of his whole inquiry, that is, the reality of the material world and of its laws. And now his theology supplies him with a short and easy method for getting rid of the sceptical doubts that had troubled him at first. He has a clear and distinct idea of his own body and of other bodies surrounding it on all sides as extended substances communicating movements to one another. And he has a tendency to accept whatever is clearly and distinctly conceived by him as true. But to suppose that God created that tendency with the intention of deceiving him would argue a want of veracity in the divine nature incompatible with its perfection. Such reasoning obviously ignores the alternative that God might be deceiving us for our good, or rather what we call truth might not be an insight into the nature of things in themselves, but a correct judgment of antecedents and consequence. Our consciousness would then be a vast sensorimotor machinery adjusted to secure the maintenance and perfection of life. Descartes, as a mathematician, places the essence of matter or body in extension. Here he agrees with another mathematical philosopher, Plato, who says the same in his Timaeus. So far the coincidence might be accidental, but when we find that the Frenchman, like the Greek, conceives his materialized space as being originally divided into triangular bodies, the evidence of unacknowledged borrowing seems irresistible. The more so that Hyens mentions this as customary with Descartes. The great author of the method and the meditations, for after every critical deduction his greatness as a thinker remains undoubted, contributed nothing to ethics. Here he is content to reaffirm the general conclusions of Greek philosophy, the necessary superiority of mind to matter, of the soul to the body, of spirit to sense. He accepts free will from Aristotle without any attempt to reconcile it with the rigid determinism of his own mechanical naturalism. At the same time, there is a remarkable anticipation of modern psychology in his doctrine of intellectual assent as an act of the will. When our judgments go beyond what is guaranteed by a clear and distinct perception of their truth, there is a possibility of error, and then the error is our own fault, the precipitate conclusion having been a voluntary act. Thus, human free will intervenes to clear God of all responsibility for our delusions as well as for our crimes. 